Hello, everybody. Keep on coming in. Come up close. We want to make room for all the other influx. Um, hello. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to my esteemed colleague, Vince Conzola. He's a principal interaction designer on our user experience design team. And this is my esteemed colleague, Amber. She's an associate manager in user experience design, supporting user or design and research operations. And so today we're here to talk to you about why research and design is a crucial aspect of development. And we plan to have you understand, in case you don't already, uh, why we don't use UX and UI interchangeably, and the dif distinction there and the relationship, how we support what you do when you're developing wonderful things, how you can apply it to what you do every day, and then, of course, because it's necessary everywhere these days to discuss briefly the impacts of AI on user experience. So first, the definitions, just so we're level set on what we're talking about today. This is just a simple infographic. Uh, most of you probably know these terms, but to unpack them briefly, information architecture, it's how people wayfind through your stuff. Nav menus and some of the words and labels and things that help them navigate which is one aspect of user interface. And the user interface is the thingy that your user touches or does something with. So it's your software or the physical thing that you're making. And that is all part of the user experience. And so we just wanted to show that that's a much broader thing than just UI, and it's not just pixels. We're researching how people find your thing, how they uh, test it out, how they decide whether it's for them, navigate through it, decide whether they want to share it with others, all of that. And it also includes the environment and the context in which they're working. And to show you why it's important to focus on UX holistically, a uh, recent Forrester research stated that a great user interface could increase conversion rate of a website by 200%. That's very significant. But a great user experience, that's the human aspect of it, could increase it by almost 400%. So now Vince is going to talk to you about how we see UX fitting into the SDLC. Thanks, Amber. So most of you have probably seen um, a model like this before that depicts the software development life cycle. It starts down there at number one with planning, which is really the um, who and why of the thing you're going to build. You know, what are your, who are your users? What are their goals? What problems are they trying to solve? Then it goes to analysis, which is the uh, what you're going to build. So that's your product requirements, things like that. What are we going to build it? Then you move to design, which really answers the question of how. How are we going to do this? What processes are, gonna, are we going to use? How are our teams going to be organized, things like that. And then finally, or we move up into implementation and testing and integration. That's when you're actually building the thing. And it's important during, this, in the, during these phases to make sure that you're building the thing right. So you want to make sure that there's not a lot of bugs, that it's usable to your end users. So it's about building the thing right. And then you move over to maintenance, which is really about answering the question, did we build the right thing? So if your requirements weren't complete, if new requirements have come in, if you got something really wrong, maybe you didn't build the right thing. And so once your product's in the market and you're in that maintenance phase, you'll take learnings from that and feed them back into planning again, and the whole thing is iterative. It's cyclical. So the output of step six will lead to the input of your next version of your model or of your product. So what I've done here is I've just taken that circular model and I've laid it out linearly so that we can show all the touch points between user experience design, user research um, at each step in that model. So starting in the planning phase and going all the way through the maintenance phase. So now Amber's going to talk about how research supports the software development lifecycle. So just a few examples. Uh, Vince did a great job setting this up that in engineering, a lot of times we're focused on building the thing right in the first place. 
And most of you have heard uh, there's a debate on whether it's Lululemon or Lululemon. I've heard a lot of things. Uh, but Astro Pants were this big release a few years ago. Have any of you heard about those? They sold millions and millions of these things. And then women discovered that whenever they would bend a little bit, you could see right through them. And that was not the intent. Uh, that was not as advertised. So they lost about $70 million on that and a little hit to their reputation as well. Uh, so it is important to build things correctly. And user testing would have really helped here. Human beings would wear them and would have bent over pretty quickly and discovered that. Uh, <laughs> next is it is important to build the right thing. How many of you have heard of or watched The Many Saints of Newark? How many of you have heard of The Sopranos? OK, so The Many Saints of Newark was developed by the same studio. It was a, like that backstory. They went back and did the old characters, and they thought everyone that loved The Sopranos would love this. Critics said that it really wasn't that badly made, just there wasn't an appetite for that. Nobody really watched it, and so they lost over $40 million by not just asking some folks, hey, any interest in seeing these young versions of The Sopranos? And then it's also important, even when you have an idea that people, you think they do have an appetite for it, it's important to test ideas before over-investing. I probably don't have to tell you about Google Glasses, because we all heard about them. It sounded really cool. Zero people bought them. And they have wasted about a billion dollars in that before they finally said, OK, it's time to stop. And they may have just been ahead of their time on it. But those are the things that research can help us with. Now, I've been asked a lot of times, can we automate testing? And you certainly can do that for QE testing, making sure that the thing works right as intended. And so here's an example of a chair where you're load testing it. Can someone sit in this chair if they weigh this amount of pounds this many times? Certainly. But human beings are not machines. And so they're going to surprise you with novel ways that they're going to use your thing. They're going to have different expectations of it, maybe unintended. And this is the reason that, and you can go look at this, because Vince didn't believe me. If your girlfriend has a curling iron under the bathroom sink, it has a sticker on it that says it's for external use only. So people do weird stuff with things. And <laughs> that's why we need <laughs> to see how they use them. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So here is just a table. It's not comprehensive, but it's intended to show that flattened out software development life cycle and just some of the things that we can do at every single phase. A lot of times, research is brought in toward the end. We made a thing. Will people like it? But we can help with, is this the right thing to build? Will they care? Uh, can we get more definition on the problem before we proceed? I'm just going to give you a few examples. This is a beautiful graph that one of our researchers created. Some product managers had over 200 problems to solve in their backlog. It was overwhelming. And then the engineers had different opinions on where to start. So we broke these down into simple outcome statements and put them in front of users and asked them two questions about each thing. How much do you, it was much more scientific than this, but we essentially asked, how much do you care about this? How important is it to you? And how well served do you feel about it right now? And that put them beautifully on a two-dimensional graph so that we could clearly see the places where they felt underserved and they cared about it the most so everyone could agree and couldn't really argue with the user's perspective that that's the place that will have the highest impact in our next release. Another uh, really fun and useful type of study, you'll see that I have both for two very different phases of the cycle. Uh, getting some information architecture input. Because even if you make a great thing that people want, if they can't find their way to it, it, it doesn't exist in their world. So the first example is a card sort. And this, uh, in software, is putting a bunch of names of things that you have and then asking people, if you had to organize a menu, where would you put this? Or an example of groceries. Just dump a whole bunch of groceries in front of a person and say, what aisles would you put these things on? And after you do that with enough people, you start to see patterns of whether people care more that it's a bread product or that it's savory versus sweet. You start to learn uh, how you can put things where people are going to be looking for them. 
And that's great to do in that analysis phase. Then later you have, or maybe you already have a product that you want to test out to see are people finding things. And that's where TreeJack can come in. Here, you give them your navigation menu and ask them to find certain things. Or in the grocery store example, now we've put things out there and we might say, all right, you're at an Airbnb, all it has is salt, pepper, and oil. You want to make a beautiful, romantic Italian dinner, go. And you might find them uh, looking for the matches next to the candles, but they're not there. And you'll watch all the false paths that they go down and where they get frustrated. So you can see, oh, this is where we really should put it, or maybe we should have it in two places. And it yields these really like nerd sexy diagrams called dendrograms or, tr or pie charts to tell you the false paths that people go down or where people coalesce on where stuff belongs in their own mental models. One example at Red Hat, it was, this was a little while ago, and this falls into like the three, four part of the stage. We were very excited that we had made this wonderful thing where now people didn't have to leave uh, to, to go into Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platforms to create a cluster. We created documentation with steps for it, so even somebody totally fresh at this could do it, and we tested it, and it took as little as three minutes. Then we tested it with people, and people are messy. And so three out of four people could not do it without help and they did not use the documentation. And then when we asked them to try using the documentation, it was confusing. And so with a lot of help, it took them about 10 times what we expected. And that was really helpful before we pushed it out so that we could refine both the process and the documentation to make it actually work for the target audience. Uh, so now Vince is gonna give you some examples of how design supports software development. Okay, so just like research, design should ideally start in the planning phase with doing research, taking the research that seeks to, to uh, figure out your who and your why for your product and translating that into artifacts that can be used to assist the design. So for example, one of the things that can come out of that research is a user persona. And a persona is really just an archetype of a, of a certain class of users. So it's a fictitious person and it's a one-page summary of that user's, you know, a little bit about their background, what their goals are, how they measure success, what problems they're trying to solve. And it's a nice, very nice, simple summary of your, each one of your user classes that you're trying to satisfy. Another artifact that comes out of the research done during the planning phase is what's called a journey map. And so here, we're taking the persona, Abigail, Archi Abigail Architect, and plotting out all of her touch points with the product or service. So maybe she starts by looking at the website, then she actually uses the UI. At some point, she's probably going to have to talk to support. And so it's laying out that whole journey that she will take interacting with your product or service and figuring out, letting that knowledge impact the design. The analysis phase is answering the question, what? So for user experience and design, it's really about helping the developers define the UI requirements from the standpoint of the users. And the best practice is to write those in the form of user or job stories, which look like, as a blank, I want to be able to blank so that I can blank. So let's illustrate that by way of an example. So I want you to imagine for a minute that you're working for a company that creates white, a wayfinding app for the city of Boston. And one of the requirements is provide directions to get from BU to Fenway Park. So just take a minute and think about how you would do that and what those directions might look like. All right, so what are some of the assumptions that you made in designing your app? Did you automatically assume that people would be driving that route? Or did you assume that they'd be walking it? Did you assume that they would, oh, it's just, <laughs> just notification. Did um, you assume that they knew the relationship directionally between those two points? 
So did you think, well, okay, I'll just tell them to head northwest like Google does sometimes. It drives me crazy. I don't, if I knew where northwest was, I would know where I was going. Um, so you make assumptions when you have vague requirements like this. So compare that to a requirement that says something like, as a visitor to Boston, I want to be able to see the route from BU to Fenway Park so that I can decide if I should walk, take the T, or call an Uber. If you're given a requirement like that, written from the standpoint of a user, you're more likely to get an experience that looks like this. And one of the things I love about Google Maps, and I've used it so much this week, I'm from Raleigh, and I've been in Google Maps constantly while I've been here, is they have, in the upper left-hand corner, they have the multi-modes of transportation. So it doesn't make an assumption about how you're going to travel from somewhere to somewhere else. Even if I put in Raleigh, North Carolina as my destination, it will tell me that it takes 274 hours to walk from Boston or from uh, BU to Raleigh, North Carolina. Another thing they do is they provide layers so I could get a satellite view. So if I do decide to walk, I can see are there sidewalks along that whole path between these two points, and I use that all the time. So as your requirements are richer, so you're also probably going to get a richer user experience. As we move into the design phase, um, this is where we start to figure out the what. So for UX, that's, you actually start doing the design. So what are you, what are you going to build? What's it going to look like? And a lot of times, this will involve starting with hand-drawn sketches or very low-fidelity digital prototypes. And all we're trying to do here really is figure out what's the layout of the page going to look like and what's the flow going to look like between pages. And doing it like this, it's very it's helpful for exploring ideas. You can come up with a bunch of ideas, um, run them by stakeholders, get feedback, and iterate quickly. And that's what you're trying to do during the design phase. I want to digress here just for a minute and talk a little bit about design systems. Um, as you're doing this design, low fidelity design, and moving in towards a higher fidelity design, um, you can use what's called a design system. Most, pe most of you might be familiar with them, but what they are is really a collection of elements and components that you can put together like Legos to build the UI. So they're different button styles, it's menus, it's uh, colors, it's typography, all of those things that you would use to build a website together. And most large companies have design systems. At Red Hat, we have a design system called Patternfly. And it's completely open source, and it's really well documented. And it gives you not only the visuals, but it also gives you the code that you can use to build your UI. It's all, it's all written in React. And I, like I said, it's um, completely open source. So if you work for a smaller company, or if you're a student, you have a project you might want to build on your own, um, I would encourage you to check out the Patternfly website and see all the tools that are available there for you. One last thing that is done during the design phase is a content strategy. And I am by no means an expert in content strategy. There is one here in the room. But um, basically, your content strategy is figuring out the best inf information to deliver, where, when, and how the users need it. So it's things like, what terminology are we going to use? Um, what's our help strategy or user assistance strategy going to be? What's our error messaging going to be like? Things like that. It's not actually creating the content for those, but it's kind of figuring out what's our strategy to deliver the information to the users. During the implementation and uh, testing and integration phases, that's where we're actually building the thing. We're building the product. So as the developers are developing the back end and the front end, the UI design is going from this lower fidelity phase or state to a higher fidelity prototype. And the idea here is by the, by the time something's ready to be implemented by the development team, you want to have a mock-up or a prototype that is exactly what you want the user to see. And so you want to give your developers enough information and enough fidelity so that they can take what you give them and create something that looks just like this. And just like, you know, just like in the development, uh, for the developers, it's also iterative. So you're going to design, you're going to test, you're going to run it past stakeholders, you're going to run it by users, you're going to go back and redesign. And so it's really important during this phase that you're working very closely with development. And if you're working in, in Agile, like this is where your sprints happen. And so 
it's super important that design stay ahead of development by a sprint or two so that the design can be completely finalized and ready to go when the developers are ready to take it on and do the implementation. So those are some examples of how both UX research and UX design influence and are crucial to the software development life cycle. And we could have gone into a lot more detail on a lot of these things. We just wanted to give you kind of a flavor for it today. And so like Amber mentioned at the beginning, um, no talk in 2024 would be complete without the impacts of AI. And so I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about things that I've read, sort of a summary of things that I've read and some of my own ideas about how AI might impact UX going forward. And if you're reading at all in any of the UX literature, you've probably seen quotes similar to these. You know, I probably read a half dozen of them from different people. Um, but they all basically say the same thing. And Kelsey Hightower actually kind of mentioned this during his keynote on Tuesday. The idea that you're not going to lose your job to AI, but you might lose it to someone who uses AI better than you do. So AI is going to be a tool that we can use. I don't think we need, at least not in the foreseeable future, hopefully I'll be retired by then, I don't foresee a time in the near future where AI is going to replace designers or replace researchers, but it can provide value to us to help us do our jobs better. So where do I think, what are some areas where AI can assist UX? Um, first of all is in ideation. Uh, LLMs, they can produce pretty much infinite options in zero time. So if you're at a, a state where you're going to do some brainstorming, you're trying to figure out, you, you have you know, totally blank slate, you can ask an LLM to provide you, you know, give me 10 different ways to do this, and it'll, it'll provide you 10 different ways to do this immediately. Um, it's also very helpful for content generation. Writing microcopy, making content more concise. It's good for first drafts. It's probably not going to get you to your final content, but it's a good place to start. Then finally, analyzing qualitative research. It's really, really good at summarizing things. So if you've got a bunch of interview transcripts that you need to summarize into a concise report, you can use AI, LLMs mostly, to summarize all of that content for you and put it in a very consumable package. Again, you're probably going to have to tweak it a little bit, but it's a really good way to start. So that's areas where AI can assist. Where is it not likely to impact UX? First is in tasks that require human judgment, things like critiquing design. Figuring out it's really good at creating a bunch of designs, but if you ask it between these two designs, which one's the best, it's probably not going to be very good at that because it takes human judgment, background knowledge, information that probably isn't built into an LLM. Another place is in internationalization. Um, because most of the training data for these LLMs comes from English-speaking sources, if you are needing to do not only translating content, but also if you're trying to design culturally specific features, like if you have a product that you want to uh, you know, deliver in the US, but then also maybe have a version that's going to go to Japan, AI probably isn't going to help you very much because it's just not, doesn't have the training data to help you under, help understand the cultural differences in different parts of the world, non-English speaking parts of the world. Um, and then finally, replacing real users as research participants. I've heard people say, well, we don't really need people anymore to do research. All the information in the world is on it built into these LLMs. We can just ask them. Well, that's not really true because people are variable. As Amber said, they use things in unexpected ways. Human behavior isn't something that an LLM is going to understand because we're just too weird. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Amber for final thoughts. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure that if you were um, excited or curious about this, you were able to walk out with a few next steps. So these are uploaded where you will be able to access the slides. And uh, first of all, some scrappy things you could do, like Monday. Um, ask your users if you can just observe them while they use your product. They are often pretty happy to do that. Uh, and it's a wonderful way of getting context and seeing where they struggle that they might not even think to mention in a formal type of research anyway. 
Also, another real quick thing that you could do is a heuristic evaluation. So there, these are links with some explanation of those. They're like the 10 commandments of usability. You can look through the UI yourself and probably find 10 to 110 things that you could do to make better right now. Also, uh, try it out. Vince mentioned really low-fi prototype testing. You do not have to have code and functionality behind things. You can kind of wizard of Oz it and try it out before you invest too much in something. And then those information architecture tests that I showed, I am not here to endorse Optimal Workshop, but I will say we've used it, and they do offer a free study. So next week, you could use that free study to try out a card sort or a tree jack. And then as far as where do I find people for this, obviously it's really ideal if you can find real actual users or maybe you have a new thing, so target users. But it's still better to get some information than zero. So you could call in a colleague or a peer as long as they're really pretty far removed from your actual project or product. Mechanical Turk on Amazon is an option for some simple tasks, very inexpensive to use. And then friends and family sometimes will, will do things for chocolate. So just tell them <laughs> you're not looking for a pat on the back. You would really appreciate them being brutal so that they can give you meaningful feedback on those. And finally, some design resources uh, from Nielsen Norman Group, Interaction Design Foundation, and some others that Vince and I have used ourselves and found really helpful. And we also told you how you can stay in touch with us. That's it. We have a couple minutes for questions, probably, if anybody mm -hmm. has any. Oh, no. Not Katie. This is going to be really hard. <laughs> so one perception that we you kind of touched upon, but I'd like to even hear more about, is this UX versus UI. And there are... When working with teams, we find sometimes that like, oh, we don't have a UI, like, you know, what do you need? Can you talk a little bit about what UX could do when there is no graphical user interface? I think especially the stuff that Amber talked about at the beginning with the discovery type of research, just understanding the who and the why goes a long way. And that's, and that's UX training 101. I mean, doing that discovery, the what problem are we trying to solve? So UX can definitely help there whether or not there's a UI or not, just figuring out who the target audience should be and what the goals that they want to accomplish are with your product. And then also I remind them that even if it's CLI, the I stands for interface. There, it is a thingy, and they, they, they use it. And I've actually observed designers, uh, sorry, developers that mostly work in CLI and found opportunities to make it better. Like when they're running a really long script and then they're just looking for a visual anchor point some places. Or th it, there are always opportunities to make it easier for them to find keyboard shortcuts or uh, prompt them when some, so there's really always something to be learned. It's not just about making it pretty. Yes, you random stranger, sir, <laughs> <laughs> on our team. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I was curious. You cover a few things on Amber. You cover some things on discoverability. So, you know, how do we know if you're, you know, you're answering the right problems or the right outcomes? And Vince, you went into the design process itself, and I'm wondering what how, what happens after. How do we know we built the right thing, right? And the thing the, from your chart, Vince, the thing that I could remember was test and iterate, but once we actually shipped it, the following step was maintenance. So it's a matter of, okay, we ship something, let's just maintain it, or once we ship it, how do we validate further along that we are actually addressing real issues and how do we course correct if we need to? Awesome, awesome. okay. So a lot of times when people get really excited about making something, they get right to the problem solving and solutioning and don't actually spend time defining success criteria. So that would be a start, is if we build this, we expect what? Will there be an adoption uptick? Will uh, they resubscribe? Will we get more money? Uh, what are you going to say that, that it made an impact? And so that's really the essential thing. Uh, 
And then if you, if possible, get a baseline. So like, well, how frequently are they clicking on it now? So that then you can compare after that lands. But it's really important to be purposeful and intentional about what we do instead of just scrambling to do a thing, but to know what we're expecting to happen. Or you can't tell if it did what you intended if you weren't working with intent. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I think we have time maybe for one more. Do you have your own question you have? Or are you saying? I do. Go I, I just wanted to see if anybody else did. Um, so this is kind of referencing the what you had said earlier on with the TV show. I'm forgetting the name. Many Saints of Newark. Mm -hmm. You said that a better example of a way that they could have built the right thing is if they actually asked people, you know, would you be interested in, you know, watching the sort of remake of The Sopranos, let's say. And, I kind of put myself in those shoes for a little bit, and I tend to be the kind of person that's just like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, but in reality, I, I might not watch it. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like, what you do in scenarios like that where users are just like, yeah, this is a great idea, even though they might not actually think that and how you account for those situations. Good plant uh, research intern. So <laughs> we wouldn't actually do that, right? We, we would never in a real encounter say, here's this thing. Do you like it? Would you use it? Because people have a tendency to want to be pleasant and say yes. And also they do think, oh, yeah, sure, that sounds cool. So you have to use a lot of craftiness without being deceptive, kind of a little bit of distraction or be more broad. What are some things that you would love? You love the Sopranos uh, franchise. What, what would you love to see next from that and see if they get there, rather than kind of trying to, to frame it so that you get them to the answer that you want? Do you have, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, I want to just throw in something else here, too. A more, a more recent example is Threads. I think that was what it was called, right? I don't even remember now from Facebook. I mean, everybody was all in on Threads because they were so anti Elon Musk, and you know, Twitter is the worst thing in the world. And so Facebook's going to build threads, and everybody's going to change and move over. And now it's, what, a year, year and a half later? Is anyone using threads? Does it even exist anymore? I have no idea. So I mean, they, somebody, they heard the zeitgeist, and it was, you know, we're ready to move on from uh, Twitter, but they weren't. I think it's time for the panel to get set up, right? Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming.